You may or may not realize this, horror fan, but John Carpenter died for your sins. When The Thing came out in 1982, it was torn apart by critics who were, in that pre-internet day, still considered an authority in what movies are and aren't worth seeing. Audiences left the theater confused and upset, and it was pretty much unanimous opinion that The Thing was absolute garbage, worst movie of the year. The studio made its money back, but Carpenter was fired from his next directing job, and his career never really recovered. I have a few critics I'd like to spend just five minutes with in a room alone. Each one of them. Uh, I'd like a little payback. Forgive us our trespasses, John Carpenter. Today, The Thing is considered a horror masterpiece, quietly rising through the ranks from cult film to genuine classic over the last 40 years. There's a board game now, and a video game, and a comic, and a bad prequel, and a puzzle that's impossible to finish because gore is all the same color. The Thing is an alien life form frozen in Antarctica for thousands of years before it's inadvertently dug up and thawed back to life by researchers. It consumes its victims in an explosion of blood and guts and then copies them precisely to infiltrate new hunting grounds. Body horror works by taking advantage of disgust, a reaction we evolved as a way to identify and reject parasites and disease. Of course, this is just another way of saying that body horror exists all over the place in real life, in the bacteria that causes leprosy or syphilis, the various worms that cause elephantiasis or sit in your stomach and eat all your food or have to be spooled out of your foot like an angry forever noodle, as well as elsewhere in nature, in parasites that make frogs grow extra legs or hijack the brains of crabs and drive them around like a golf cart or turn insects into modern art. There's a parasitic worm that has to ultimately be eaten by birds to complete its life cycle, so what it does is it stuffs itself inside the eye stalks of its snail host and f***ing pulsates like a goddamn strobe light at a trailer park rave in my personal hell. But disgust is not the same as horror. For body horror to work, it has to attack us philosophically, remind us of our discomfort with any ambiguity about where control over the form and function of our own bodies start and stop, and how fragile that boundary really is. What law scholar Martha Nussbaum calls a shrinking from contamination that is associated with the human desire to be non-animal. The thing inspires this feeling in a couple of ways. The first and most obvious one is by being really gross. It was the opinion of critics in 1982 that grossness was all that's happening here. Just dumb, sloppy gore. But if that's the case, then why is the thing considered such a classic now? Fortunately, Hollywood has blessed us with another version of the thing to compare the original with, and in doing so, answer that question. The 2011 thing is every bit as inventive in its grossness, and yet still manages to be completely forgettable. If the thing is all just gore, then why isn't the 2011 version considered just as great? The easy answer is that the prequel replaced Rob Bettine's genius practical effects with the computer-generated monster. This was absolutely a tragic decision, especially considering how much effort the crew of the 2011 thing put into making those designs, only to have it all scrapped later. There's an artistry in practical effects that's lost in CG, and it's a shame that Hollywood is still in this phase where showing off the newest technology is more important than the movie that technology is in. But listen when I say that the reason practical effects tend to be in better movies is not because practical effects look more real. This does not look real. This does not look real. The 1982 thing is very obviously a puppet. The problem with the 2011 thing isn't that it's digital, the problem is that the poor digital thing has to carry the whole movie. The 2011 thing fell into the trap of thinking that because they could physically do whatever they wanted with the monster, everything surrounding the monster, the basics of filmmaking that John Carpenter altered to make this movie so strange didn't matter. If a modern analysis about the John Carpenter version doesn't focus on the film's special effects, it tends to revolve around the theme of paranoia. The Thing's ability to behave exactly like its victim presents a serious problem for Kurt Russell and company, as everybody's trust in each other to be what they look like gradually erodes making them all the more vulnerable to being attacked. This is the source of most of the movie's tension. But the vehicle of that tension isn't the monster's existence. It's how Carpenter convinces us, despite the clear fakeness of what we're looking at, that the monster is real. Movies aren't very long, which means every scene and every shot that constructs every scene has to be useful. You don't have time to let the audience know the ins and outs of every single person in your cast of 12, so you use shortcuts. McCready is a bad loser. He drinks a lot. Palmer is a stoner. 
Clark prefers dogs over people. The 2011 thing does this too, but toward a lazier purpose. Rather than showing us who these people are in their daily lives, this film shows us what archetype they are, so we can easily plug them into a standard Hollywood narrative. Here's our protagonist, with whom we are meant to identify. We know she's our protagonist because the film is from her perspective, and because she's eminently capable and makes every important discovery and every reasonable suggestion over the course of the movie. Here's our antagonist. We know he's our antagonist because he values scientific fame over the good of the group, and because he says things like this. In the future, don't contradict me in front of those people again. Whether we have a love interest here is debatable, but I can't think of any other purpose for including shots like this, and I would be stunned if the production notes for this movie didn't have a demand from the studio to include at least the suggestion of a romance. I've fortunately never been subject to a disfiguring or life-threatening disease, so I can't say from personal experience what that's like, but if something like this were to ever happen to you, I can tell you a couple things you wouldn't worry about. Sexual politics and your least favorite coworker. John Carpenter's Thing is a creature that threatens the most basic human needs of safety and security, which, if Maslow's hierarchy of needs is at all valid, absolutely have to be fulfilled before we ever even start to think about things like personal relationships or life accomplishments. Those are concerns of the superego, things you're allowed to think about when you are able to trust that there are certain aspects of your personhood that are inviolable that you are who you think you are. In asking his audience to think of those things as important in this context, the 2011 thing by definition asks you to disregard the monster as a credible threat to human safety. Now, it's not unreasonable for the 2011 thing to center around themes of social order and self-esteem, because that's what most movies do. It's part of the formula for narrative film that has existed for nearly a hundred years. It's certainly present in the very first filmed version of the thing, directed by Howard Hawks and 1951, but horror movies are not most movies. For example, John Carpenter's decision to hide the eyes of his characters when they're speaking with each other is a cinematography sin. The eyes are where we automatically gravitate when we're watching someone speak. It's how we make human connections. So when Carpenter shoots dialogue like this, with one person turning their back to the camera or wrapped up in parkas and dark glasses, the opportunity to establish camaraderie between these characters is fragmented, cementing the implication that they've spent so much time with one another that they're not so much a team as a group of people who have settled into being alone together. The 1982 thing is populated not so much by people as by people-shaped objects, who we come to know by names that aren't really names. Childs, windows, nalls. This is what bothered Roger Ebert, who had this to say about it. I think the characters, they're not made into three-dimensional people. Their function is to walk down the corridor and be jumped on. Well, yeah, doy. That's what the thing turns you into. When you find yourself turned into prey, you lose the privilege of imagining yourself as having any greater purpose. The loss of ambitions, relationships, and all the other things that make you more than an animated hunk of meat are what Carpenter highlights the few times he chooses to shoot dialogue correctly. He allows you to watch people connect with each other only when what they're saying is really, really important. Trust's a tough thing to come by these days. How long were you alone with that dog? But Critty, I know Bennings. I've known him for 10 years. He's my friend. Compare this to the 2011 thing, where the camera treats every human connection equally, from discussing alien biology to passing a beer. When the Norris thing splits into multiple pieces and kills one of the team, the monster is the focus of the scene. Suddenly we get its point of view, with the human's reactions happening secondary to the thing's movements. The actual victim of the thing's violence disappears entirely until his corpse appears later on. Here's essentially the same scene in the 2011 version. It starts off pretty good, when the arm attack is the focus, but then the thing stabs two people one after the other, and the camera decides for you which of these two characters is more important. We get six full reaction shots for the death of this character, even though just off screen, this is about to happen to someone else. The camera is asking you to prioritize grief when survival itself is at stake, and it throws off all the tension the scene has been building up to this point. It's only six shots, but they matter. That's six shots that say, this monster can be dealt with later. That is precisely the opposite of the feeling this monster is supposed to embody, and neutralizes the ways the 2011 thing improved on its design. Technology made the thing heavy and fast, and allowed it to use its host even more disturbingly, seeing with human eyes, screaming with a human voice. Ah! 
But these aesthetics fall flat if everything around the monster is telling you the monster doesn't really matter. Boom! Jesus Christ. <laughs> There are a number of reasons people have pointed to for why John Carpenter's arguably best movie was so hated upon its release, but they all ultimately pretty much boil down to the 80s being a really weird time. One of those eras where the dominant culture decided everything was fine, despite all the things happening around everyone that were definitely not fine. This was the time of the action star, when tough guys like Kurt Russell were supposed to save the day, not freeze to death in moral and physical ambiguity. Where's the triumph? Where's the romance? One of my favorite reviews of the thing is by David Denby, who said in New York Magazine that violence in movies can be exciting, cathartic, even beautiful, but the tendency among recent horror filmmakers to split open the human body in the quest for weirder and weirder thrills comes close to outright obscenity. The Thing is a movie about deformity and is, appropriately, itself deformed. It takes the framework of film narrative that we've come to expect from our familiarity with movies and turns it into something awful, a challenge to the idea that we should think of violence, in movies or otherwise, as exciting, cathartic, or beautiful. You might think your world is comprised of your loves, your wishes, your experiences, your thoughts and dreams, but John Carpenter knows different. John Carpenter is here to bring you the bad news that for all your fancy ideas about who you are and what you mean, you're really in the end just meat. You're really in the end just a thing.